Yeah, thank you so much for coming. I'm so encouraged to see this many people here to think about something that is very, very important. I'd like to pray and then have you look at a text with me before we launch into these sometimes complex and very relevant issues for your life, where you are, whether you're single or married, whether you're young or old, you're all male and female, male or female. And so how you live that out at whatever age is a large part of who you are as God made you. And so this gets real close to your very core identity. So let's pray and ask for God's help. Father, we want to talk about man as male and female and what the differences are and why they matter. And everyone in the hearing of my voice is male or female and called to be that under your sovereign care as the creator and the redeemer of the world. And so help me be faithful to your revelation. You have not left us without a word about these things. We're not drifting in ignorance. Your word speaks to this issue. And I believe on many scores it speaks clearly, even if every problem it doesn't address. And so I pray that there would be granted here a love of Christ and a love of his word and a submissive spirit, male and female, to you as our great God and authority and redeemer. Come, I pray. And help me, help us when we have chance to interact, to go deep about these things and lead lives that display Christ more fully to this world, we pray in his name. Amen. Let's go to Second Timothy, just for an introduction. Give you a little biography or autobiography and take First Timothy as my, Second Timothy as my... Starting place. Second Timothy 3, very familiar text in verses 16 and 17. Not as familiar if you go back up to verse 14. So let's do that. Second Timothy 3, verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have faithfully believed, knowing from whom you learned it. Now, who is that? Look at chapter 1, verse 5. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. I think that's who Paul's talking about. So back to 314. As for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you heard it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted. So there it is, from childhood. This is not just Paul as the source. This is somebody who's been around him since childhood. And now from childhood, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And here's the famous part. All scripture is breathed out by God, inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. And that would mean good work, including how to pastor a church or how to be a husband or how to do whatever you do in a godly way as a man or as a woman, as the case may be. The Bible is sufficient to make us competent and able to do the good works he calls us to do and do them in a way that pleases the Lord. But the thing I want to do by way of leaping into my own autobiography is to simply say, 
knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise. I grew up in a, a home for which I give continual thanksgiving. I was comforting in an email my daughter-in-law who lost her baby, what is it, about seven weeks ago now, and my son Abraham, and I was writing about crying, and I said to her, um, don't worry if you don't cry one day. You'll cry in 30 years over felicity. You will. So don't worry that you're leaving her behind. You're not. Because I, at age 62, who lost my mother at age 28, can cry any day I choose about that. Or not. Grief is a strange thing. All I have to do is put together a sequence of thoughts in my head. Little baby Karsten sitting on her, her knee in the kitchen. Two years old. My oldest son. Discovering just after her funeral that my wife was pregnant with Benjamin, my second son, who would never know her. And one or two others, and I'll cry. So I said to her, don't, don't fret. Uh, Felicity will always be there. You'll never minimize her. There will be days that you'll say to her, you're very happy today in heaven, and I'm very happy here. Let's not cry today, and that will be good. And there'll be other days where you'll say, you're very happy in heaven, and I miss you very much. And you'll cry, and that'll be good. So I grew up in a home where uh, I loved Ruth Piper, my mother. My father was a traveling evangelist, as some of you know, and he was gone, let's say, two-thirds of the year, in and out, in and out. My life was one sequence of farewells, sad, daddy's home, glad. And so here's the impact it had on manhood and womanhood. I was brought up basically by my mother. When daddy was away, she did everything. And she taught me everything. We had a little laundromat one time off to the side of the ministry. She ran it, taught me how to run it. She taught me how to cut the grass, overlap, let the edge of the grass run down into the middle of the lawnmower, otherwise you're going to leave skippers. Pull up the Bermuda grass by the roots, otherwise it's going to come back in a week. When you paint, start at the top and go down, not at the bottom, and go up on the side of the house. When you make french fries, we had a big oil french fries maker. Make sure the oil is boiling before you put them in, otherwise they get soggy. When you make a pancake, Make sure that you don't flip it until you see bubbles around the edge of the pancake. My mother taught me everything. I darned socks. I knitted. <laughs> I made, I mean, the extent of my crochet was bathroom rugs <laughs> and potholders. But my mother taught me everything she knew. I ironed. I did everything both male things and female things. She handled all the finances, all the checkbook things, paid all the bills. Daddy was never around for any of that. And when he came home, you would think, now here's a woman who is, in my judgment, omnicompetent. I never grew up with the slightest notion that woman was inferior to man, except perhaps in raw physical strength. Because my mother, was manifestly competent in everything she did, probably better than daddy in most things. So that's the home I grew up in. I watched that happen. But when daddy came home, everything shifted, joyfully shifted, not chafingly shifted. He would walk into that house and my mother would go immediately into support daddy mode. 
extol daddy mode, respect daddy mode. And she'd sit at the table. She wouldn't lead. She'd sit there. Daddy would say, let's pray. Otherwise, mommy would say, Johnny, pray. As soon as she's there, daddy's saying, let's pray. Daddy's saying, family, it's time for devotions. Daddy is saying, it's time to go to church. Daddy is saying, let's go out to eat. Daddy is opening the door. Daddy's doing the garage door. Daddy is calling the waitress over. Daddy's doing everything by way of initiative and leadership. And my mother is loving it. Wishing probably he were home more often. I didn't, as a little boy, taste the pain of this marriage. Now they're both gone. They didn't let me in on that till later. And how hard it was to not have a man around. My mother was five feet two inches tall. I reached five two at about age 13. And then I grew up another, I'm five nine. And, and so I towered over my mother. At least I felt like I did. So here she is. She's got a 14-year-old boy that's six inches taller than she is. And he's a mouthy kid. And she needs a man around with this boy. And they told me later how they would cry. She would cry to Daddy on the phone. I need you here. I don't know what to do with this boy. And my Daddy said, I told her, sweet and firm, sweet and firm. Be sweet and be firm. And I think she wove that together about as good as it could be woven. I have been spanked by my mother with masculine force. <laughs> and my mother served me more sweetly than I've ever been served by anybody in the world. Rubbing my back at night because I was so sad. I had these awful phobias about speaking in high school, a terrible case of acne. I didn't think anybody could like me, but I had my mom, and she was at my side anywhere all the time. So Ruth Piper is just huge in my affections, and, and I know when I read this, remember from whom you learned it knowing from whom you learned it. Continue in what you've learned and continue in what you've heard, knowing from whom you've learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. I never remember seeing my mother read a book except one. She was a Bible lady. And if she had a book in her hand, it was a black book. And she quoted it to me endlessly after I left home and while I was at home. And so um, I believe that the roots of my understanding of biblical manhood and womanhood are in the Bible. I'll try to make that case with you. But I think they're in the Bible because they were mediated to me by a Bill and a Ruth Piper who in a most remarkable way pulled it off. I don't know how many of you grew up in homes where your mother and your father sang. Noel and I, when we're driving on vacation, we don't sing in the front seat for our kids to hear in the back seat. My mother and father sang a lot. They just start singing. And they harmonized beautifully. And it, it, re it was symbolic of the way their lives complemented each other. So if you wonder, what's this word complementarity? It's spelled with an E in the middle instead of an I. Complement with an I means I say nice things about you. Complement means I complete or I finish. I add to you something that makes you more whole. So when we speak of sexual complementarity, we mean the coming together of a man and a woman and they, they complement each other, they complete each other, they add to each other. Both are bringing things to this relationship that uniquely make something one flesh different than they are individually. And my mother and my father, I believe, represented that in the most remarkable way. And I think one of the most valuable things was that I grew up in a home where I knew my mother's submission was not based on lack of competency. 
So many people hear the word submission and they assume it must be rooted in a woman's inferiority or a woman's lack of competencies to lead or protect or provide or whatever. And it's not. I'm, just, I'm going to argue that has nothing to do with it. These realities of headship and submission, as we'll unfold them, are not rooted in our competencies. They're rooted in our God-given nature. And we can kick against that all we want, and in the end, we will be the losers, not God. So I thank God for Ruth Piper and that she modeled for me an omnicompetent woman who could do most things as well or better than my dad, and then when he was around, joyfully affirmed his leadership, his initiative. So to see those two things was a great gift to me, and I thank God publicly for it. Now, in the outline of what we're going to do, um, we begin with uh, why does the issue matter, this issue of male and female and the differences between us, and I have a lot of things to say here. I'm not sure how long this is going to go, but there are all kinds of reasons. Some of them are in the little booklet I think that you have, and some of them aren't. So we'll go through some of these, and uh, I'll give you the reasons why I think this issue is so crucial today. So why does the issue matter? Setting the stage in culture and church. Um, the secular feminist impulse that I, I grew up in the I was I was born in 46 I'm the oldest baby boomer and I was a teenager and a college student in the 60s and the 60s and the 70s were the great heyday of the emergence of radical feminism and uh, it has waned and been chastened in our day but hasn't by any means gone away as you'll see from some current illustrations. But back then, here's a quote from uh, social historian Jerry Muller of Catholic University uh, to give you a handle for understanding the way the words gender and sex are used in academic women's studies around the country. I think still this is the case. It goes like this. The influence of lesbianism, I'll put it on the overhead here so in case you don't have a book you can see it. The influence of lesbianism is perhaps the prime reason for an increasing focus on, quote, gender, defined as the social and cultural construct of sexual identity. The key assumption behind such work is that while men and women are biologically differentiated, biologically differentiated, the characteristic qualities of maleness and femaleness are largely artifacts of culture and arbitrarily imposed cultural constructions at that. The emphasis on the relative importance of gender, that word in particular, as opposed to sex, then, is, <coughs> is intended to challenge the assumption that differences between men and women are either natural or immutable. So there was a while where this course was called gender complementarity. I don't know how, how that happened. I don't like that use of the word gender for this reason. Gender is a grammatical term referring to he and she, and what gender does this pronoun have, masculine or feminine. Gender historically has not been used to refer to my sexuality and your sexuality, male and, and female. But it became used that way for these kinds of reasons. Sex seemed to carry the loaded message, we really are innately different. That's a bad idea for a lot of people. So gender didn't carry that because gender is arbitrarily imposed cultural construction. So you have to decide whether you want to use the word gender 
that way and join the chorus of those who might feel that way or whether you want to use the more loaded word sex. So, conclusion from that quote, in other words, in contemporary feminist usage, gender refers to what we are by social conditioning and sex refers to what we are by nature and the shift in focus from sex to gender more and more assumes that maleness and femaleness at the root level of personhood are negligible realities. Our plumbing, whether there's hair on our face, whether our voices are high or low, irrelevant realities, personhood, neglig negligible differences, deep nature things, not just what you can point to with your finger, they would say no, no significant differences. Already in 72, Charlotte Bunch argued like this. This is, this is about as radical as it gets. I've never seen anything like this, and she's probably very marginal, but you can see principles on the margins. Heterosexuality separates women from each other. It makes women define themselves through men. It forces women to compete against each other for men and the privilege which comes through men and their social standing. Lesbianism is the key to liberation. And only women who cut their ties to male privilege can be trusted to remain serious in the struggle against male dominance. That's breathtaking. She's saying that we orient in life heterosexually is inherently bad for women. And therefore lesbianism is the only way to true liberty where you do not have to have a man, you can as well have a woman. When I was in seminary, I had Paul Jewett for a professor at Fuller. He's going to be with the Lord. I do believe that. Um, he wrote a book, as you see here, Man as Male and Female, in 1975. I graduated from Fuller in 71. So this book arrived on my desk when I was a professor at Bethel in 1975, and I read it with great interest by one of my former and very good professors, who was a very brilliant and excellent theologian in many ways, and I was deeply saddened by what I read in this book. In it, he set the pattern to be followed for three decades, I would say four now. He said on the one hand, quote, sexuality permeates one's individual being to its very depth. I think that's right. I don't think you, you can bore into yourself and arrive as generic person, neither male or female, kind of androgynous. I don't think you should try to do that. I don't think you can do that. Like deep, 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 deep down I'm not woman. And deep, 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 deep down I'm not man. I'm just person. I don't think so. Sexuality permeates one's individual being to its very depth. It conditions every facet of one's life as a person. Now, he said that, and that's an amazing... Uh, admission, given what he's going to say next. But, on the other hand, he says that he shares the uncertainty of those who do not know, quote, what it means to be a man in distinction to a woman. <coughs> he confesses that all human activity reflects a qualitative distinction which is sexual in nature, but then he says, quote, in my opinion, such an observation offers no clue to the ultimate meaning of that distinction. It may be that we shall never know what that distinction ultimately means. So on the one hand, we are sexual beings to the core. 
And on the other hand, we don't know what that means. Which liberated him then to argue for the ordination of women as pastors and elders in local churches because we don't know whether it means something that would make that wrong. That is a breathtaking ignorance to say we are to the depths of our being, male and female, but we don't know what we're talking about. I just, when I read that, I thought, after all your years in the Bible, your conclusion is agnosticism with regard to maleness and femaleness? That's not very fruitful. I, I just, I, just, I, said, I, I, can't, I can't believe God would leave us there. And my experience in the Bible is that he didn't leave us that ignorant. So I was very sad and very disappointed. So there's Paul Jewett setting the pattern, which now for 40 years, you can read book after book after book. I just got weary of it after a while. I read so many on the egalitarian side over against what I, I, I consider myself complementarian. And the difference is basically egalitarian says that what you are by nature doesn't determine the fitness of your role, just your competencies do. And the complementarian says, no, what God made us by nature is significant in determining what we do with our lives and how we relate to men and women. And so he set the pattern there and, and following him have been a whole slew. Here's just a couple of uh, very gifted women whose books I have read. Uh, this is a 1987 Gretchen Gabeline Hall uh, writes, Biblical feminists lovingly asked the Christian community, this is her, and that's who she is, to abandon artificial role playing and to be sex blind in assessing each individual's qualifications for ministry. That's standard feminist egalitarian exhortation. You should not, when considering a person for eldership, take into account maleness and femaleness. Be sex blind who the pastors are, sex blind who the elders are, and, and so on. Now, let me put in a parenthesis here about the use of language. I get angry. This is a sinful tendency on my part since the Bible says be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. The anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. Amen. I repent. And then I get angry again. Um, <laughs> some anger is holy and some is not, and I'm always repenting. But I get angry at this kind of use of language because it's manipulative, it's clever. And you find it all over the newspaper, you find it all over political speeches. Oh, for a politician who's just straightforward. Just, just, he's not doing any of this. I'll show you what I mean. Now, what she wants to do, and, and this is totally appropriate for her to do within her framework, is to say, I don't believe you should take sexuality into account in assigning roles in the church. Fine, let's argue about that. But look at the language. Biblical feminists lovingly ask the Christian community to abandon artificial role playing. Why, why do you use that word? Why do you put the label on me of artificiality and role play? Why don't you just say it in a way that we can be on equal ground of conviction here? Why put an ugly, demeaning word on my position? This is what I call, I wrote it there and tried to erase it, um, the, <laughs> the fallacy of the excluded middle. You know what that is in logic? You look at Piper's position or whatever position you don't like, and then, or, or um, that's not the way to say it. You look at, you look at where you are, and to defend it, you describe your, your alternative here as way over here. So instead of saying, I'm in favor of being sex blind, and these people think you should sensitively and wisely take sex into consideration, 
you say artificial role playing. Let's get rid of this and do this, which means the middle is excluded. And for undiscerning readers, they get sucked into that. Undiscerning readers read, well, yeah, of course we don't want artificial role playing, so she must be right. Because there's no other alternative here. That happens all the time. Just I'm, I'm beckoning all of you in this little parenthesis on language to grow up the way you read the newspaper, the way you listen to the radio, the way you hear sermons. When you hear people doing that, suspect them. Be suspicious of them. They're, they're, they're doing something devious. They're not treating their opponent in a way they would like to be treated. If you, if you find me doing this in this seminar, you can come up to me between times or afterwards and say, didn't you do what you said she shouldn't do? Here's another example. Uh, Mary Stuart Van Leeuwen expresses her confidence in the Bible's, quote, main thrust, the Bible's main thrust is toward the leveling, not the maintenance, and then she does the same language thing, of birth-based status differences. Now that word status is loaded, right? It's got a connotation of putting yourself, I want a certain status in the church. I want to have a status. So if I call for all-male eldership, I got a status problem. I want men to have status. Well, I hope, I pray, that's not what's going on in my head or my heart. But she puts that label on it so that you can't disagree with it. You're, you're, either, you're either a status lover or you're with her in the leveling of uh, distinctions. So we have... Uh, Dozens and dozens of books that have been written in the last 40 years arguing against the making of male and female as a significant criterion in role determination. And the argument positively is be sex blind and be sex leveling and don't take into account whether a person is a woman or a man in whatever jobs they have. And that's, I would say, the most common view in the church in America today. You will be in many groups simply considered a passe, fuddy-duddy, leftover of a bygone, male-dominating, chauvinistic era, if you take my position and say, I really think it matters that you're a woman or a man in which role you assume in a marriage or in the church or in the world. So now that we mentioned world, let me get on my soapbox here for a minute because I'm really upset about this and it just happens that I've got this seminar going on here and uh, so let me just spout off for a minute or two um, about, about this. Um, so here, here's the World Magazine. Came this week, right? These are extras. You can have them. When you write an article, they send you magazines. So I got an article in here. And uh, the title I gave it was Co-Ed Combat and Cowardice. And I will read it to you. It may take about five minutes to read it to you so you can see what I'm all worked up about. And this will be very illuminating for at least where I'm coming from in our nature, governing not just the way we behave in marriage and not just the way we relate in church, but also some of the ways we relate in wider culture, like the military. So, if I were the last man on the planet to think so, I would want the honor of saying that no woman should go before me into combat to defend my country. A man who endorses women in combat <coughs> is not pro-woman, he's a wimp. He should be ashamed for most of history and most cultures he would have been utterly scorned as a coward to promote such an idea. 
Part of the meaning of manhood as God created us is the sense of responsibility for the safety and welfare of our women. Back in the 70s, when I taught in college, feminism was new and cool, so my ideas on manhood were viewed as a social construct of a dying chauvinistic era. I had not yet been enlightened that competencies, not divine wiring, govern the roles we assume. Unfazed, I said, no. Suppose, I said, I used to use this as illustration with Bethel students in class after class because, boy, in those days, things were really popping and hot and you could get women just furious in class for these kinds of things, which was okay. We can handle that. Suppose I said a couple of you students, Jason and Sarah, were walking to McDonald's after dark and suppose a man with a knife jumped out of the bushes and threatened you. And suppose Jason knows that Sarah has a black belt in karate and could probably disarm the assailant better than he could. Should he step back and tell her to do it? Take him. <laughs> no, he should step in front of her and be ready to lay down his life to protect her irrespective of competency. It is written on his soul. That is what manhood does. And after he's on the ground, then she can take him out. <laughs> but he's proved himself to be a man, and she's proved herself to be competent. And collectively, that is what society does. Unless the men have all been emasculated by the suicidal songs of egalitarian folly, God created man first in order to say that man bears a primary burden for protection, provision, leadership. And when man and woman rebelled against God's ways, God came to the garden and said, Adam, where are you? Not Eve, where are you? And when the apostle described the implications of being created male and female, the pattern he celebrates is save her, nourish her, cherish her, give her life. God wrote manhood and womanhood on our hearts. Sin ruins the imprint without totally defacing it. It tells men to be heavy-handed oafs or passive wimps. It tells women to be coquettes or controllers. That is not God's imprint. Deeper down, men and women know it. When God is not in the picture, the truth crops up in strange forms. For example, Kingsley Brown, law professor at Wayne State University in Michigan, has written a new book called Co-Ed Combat, the, the new evidence that women should fight, should not fight the nation's wars. In an interview with Newsweek, he said, quote, the evidence comes from the field of evolutionary psychology. That's what's weird about this. So you leave God out of the picture and you just have psychology, but truth speaks. The evidence, he says, <clears throat> comes from the field of evolutionary psychology. Men don't say, this is a person I would follow through the gates of hell. Men aren't hardwired to follow women into danger, unquote. If you leave God out, the perceived hard wiring appears to be evolutionary psychology. If God is in the picture, it has other names. We call it the work of the law written on their hearts, Romans 2.15. We call it true manhood as God meant it to me to be. As usual, the truth that comes in the alien form of evolutionary psychology gets distorted. It's true that men aren't hardwired to follow women into danger, but that's misleading. The issue is not that men are being led into danger. The issue is that men are being led into combat by women. It won't work. Men are hardwired to get in front of their women, between them and the bullets. They are hardwired to lead their women out of danger and into safety, and women at their deepest, <coughs> at their deepest and most honest selves give profound assent to this noble impulse in good men. That is why co-ed combat situations compromise men and women at their core and corrupt even further the foolhardy culture that put them there. Consider where we have come. Now, this is really tragic. Consider where we have come. One promotion for Brown's book states, 
More than 155,000 female troops have been deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan since 2002. More than 70 of these women have died. Those deaths exceed the number of military women who died in Korea, Vietnam, and the Gulf War combined. Who do we thank for this collapse of chivalry? Brown suggests, quote, there are a lot of military men, there are a lot of military people who think women in combat is a horrible idea, but it is career suicide to say it. In other words, let the women die. I still have my career. May God restore sanity and courage once again to our national leaders and defenders, and may he give you a voice. So that was my rant in world last week, and I feel very, very strongly and very sad about it. I thought if we went to a draft, and this, is, this will be one of the huge issues if we ever go to a draft, because what percentage legally, constitutionally, must be women? if you force young people into the military? And the answer is going to be 50-50. Of course, the generals won't have it, but why won't they have it? Now we're into a big argument over nature and over workability. But suppose they pass it. I'd go to jail before I'd let my daughter do that. Now, she may not let me, she may be a conscientious objector, or she may be whatever, but that's how strongly I feel. I would stand between her and combat and uh, tell her, they can't make you do this. It's against God's way. And so we'll just all go to jail together. <laughs> James Dobson has been a, a wise and helpful defender. Here's an amazing statement that he says, I think James Dobson is right when he said, feminist resistance to making manhood and womanhood significant in behavior and role determination, like marriage and church and military and whatever, is partner to some of the most painful social and spiritual issues of our day. In other words, the collapse of a clear sense of what manhood and womanhood is affects many social ills today for which we are paying very dearly as a culture. Here's another, I'm, I'm still on this first point of why all this matters. Um, you young people, most of you probably will marry and have children now ask yourself this question. You, you might right now be navigating the waters of college life or professional life with vague notions of what it means to be male and female. You just kind of feel vague about it. You've got some instincts that you tend to follow, but if somebody asked you, define womanhood or define manhood, you'd be hard pressed to, to do it. Now you can get along on your instincts now, but ask yourself this question. Five, ten years out, you now have a little girl and a little boy in your home. And that little boy, little girl, is going to turn eight, nine, ten, and are going to come to you with a question like this. Mommy, Daddy, says the little boy, Daddy, what does it mean to grow up and be a man and not a woman? You better have an answer. Now what makes the question pointed is the last phrase. Because if I didn't include the last phrase, I know what the answer would be for almost every feminist. If, you only, if the little boy only asked, Daddy, what does it mean to grow up and be a man? Feminists would say, be mature, be strong, be honest have integrity, be responsible, and they give exactly the same answer to the daughter. 
strong, mature, responsible, because that's what it means to be a man and a woman. But, but that's not the question they're going to ask. And that won't be a helpful question. They'll say, but what Lydia can, can be that, and Johnny can be that. I want you to tell me, what does it mean to grow up and be a man and not a woman? Like the difference. And if all you can give them is plumbing answers, you're asking for trouble. So I think we're in a situation in the last 40 years where almost nobody can answer that question. Jewett certainly couldn't. He's one of the smartest men I ever met, Paul Jewett, my systematic theology teacher. He says, I don't have a clue what the root differences are between male and female other than body shape, hair, and all that stuff. So I really do hope to give you an answer that you can memorize and think about and root in the Bible. But before I do that, one more witness to why this matters. And it's the witness that you would expect a Christian hedonist to get to eventually. Only I'm going to let Larry Crabb say it instead of me. This is, this is a book that, um, it's a chapter in the big brown book out there, uh, Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. The What's the Difference book, I don't think I'm going to bring that, doesn't matter. The What's the Difference book that has the definitions of manhood and womanhood in it, that's also a chapter in the big brown book. So if you, if you buy the big brown book, you have all these little books included. But this is helpful to give to people because this has in it 50 typical questions all kinds of questions that people ask about this issue. And, and I use this most often when I have to get in debates with people. I say, now what did I say about that 30 years ago or 20 years ago? And I, I go remind myself what I said in answer to that question. So we asked Larry Crabb, uh, when we put this little thing out separately, would you write a little, do you believe in this? Did we get this right, Wayne Grudem and I? Uh, and he wrote this. Uh, more deeply, the more deeply I move into the lives of people, the more clearly I recognize the unique struggles and joys that come with our existence as male and female. When we blur the distinctions between the sexes or trivialize them into shallow stereotypes, we limit our opportunity for enjoying the creative brilliance of God. In my judgment, one of the central needs of Western culture in our day is a clear definition of masculinity and femininity. More personal and social problems than we suspect have their roots in the failure to live in the richness of our unique sexuality. So that's probably enough on the why does this matter question.